All right, everyone, welcome back to the Ramp Podcast. Today, I have a special guest with us. It's Kyle AC of Qualtrics. He comes to us by way of virtual studio. Kyle, welcome to the show. Thanks, Danny. Happy to be here. Absolutely, absolutely. So before we jump into those same five questions that we ask all our guests and all seasons of the Ramp Podcast, who is Kyle AC? Yeah, I, uh, so I'm about to be a father of three. We're expecting our third child pretty much any day now. So if I Amazing. disappear suddenly from the podcast, that's probably why. <laughs> I, I love to read. Not really business books, though, believe it or not. Mostly fiction, sci-fi, fantasy. Kind of a nerd with that. I love to do Legos. My, my five-year-old loved to watch sports. Occasionally unwind with the video games. And uh, if I had to say where I'm at my element, it's when I'm teaching. I love to teach and I try to apply that to a lot of what I do on my, my job. That's great. That's great. It would be a first if you had to bolt in the middle of an episode to go uh, deliver a baby or help deliver a baby. So we're fingers crossed that whatever that happens, obviously healthy and safe delivery, you know, preferably not in the middle of the recording. Well, cool. Uh, very excited for you on that front as well. I am a dad of two, so I know the drill and uh, such an exciting time in your life. So thanks for, for being with us. And if you're ready for it, would love to jump in to those five questions that we ask every guest on the Ramp Podcast. I'm ready. All right, let's do it. So the first is, what is the best investment an early career salesperson can do for themselves and why? Being able to learn resiliency. I, when I'm working with early sales professionals, they're, they're often on the emotional pendulum of one to 10 all the time. Like when it's good, it's really good. When it's bad, it's really bad. And the problem with that is when you're at a one, it's paralyzed. They're taking bad news and extrapolating out to, well, if this is bad, other things are bad. They become pessimistic, they become more negative, and then it's just self-fulfilling prophecy where everything goes wrong. When it's a 10, it's at least a complacency. Well, this is good, I've got this, it's easy, and they lose some of that urgency. And so I recommend building resiliency to, to be more in the three to seven range. Don't be a flat five, that's not human, that's robotic. But if you can be three to seven, then you're going to have a much more sustainable, enjoyable career. There, there's lots of ways to go improve mindset, lots of books, podcasts, et cetera. My, my simplest to apply advice is just to know that it's never as bad as you think it is. It's never as good as you think it is. So when you get that bad news, take a deep breath. It's probably not as terrible as it, as it sounds at first. When you get the great news, there's going to be curveballs that come. Get ready for them. But keep that balance. And if you learn that early in your career, you're going to be so far ahead of both sales professionals that are still getting just tossed around later in their career. That's great advice. Great advice. Not enough work is in, in that early stage of your career on mindset. Really, really important. A lot of times you jump into that first role or one of your first roles, you're like, I got to hit the ground running. I got to impress the right people. I got to hit the numbers. Uh, and you forget that really it is that foundational piece. Your mindset is critically important. Question off that. Uh, and you some, some tactics there too, even, even as simple as like taking a deep breath, like can resiliency and your experience of hiring folks, can resiliency be taught? Like, can you learn? If, if you couldn't learn it, then I would have had to leave sales a long time ago. I, I think people are naturally more resilient than others, but as you put focus on it, you can certainly improve. So I, I love to ask people in interviews, uh, talk to me about a time where something went horribly wrong and how you recovered. That gives me an idea at resiliency. I actually like those conversations with reps, helping them become more resilient, helping them fix their mindset because nobody's perfect at it, but it, it should be a work in progress. It should be a continued focus to improve. Yeah, great answer. I fundamentally agree with you too. Uh, I have to admit, I didn't anticipate going into sales uh, early in my career. I thought it was uh, an investment banker, finance, uh, and I took a sales role at Groupon and it was very clear, very, very early that I was going to get rejected a hell of a lot more than I ever had been in my entire life. You know, that 95, 96% rejection rate or even higher sometimes for cold calls, <laughs> that'll humble you really quickly. Well, cool. Appreciate the guidance there, Kyle. Uh, next up, question number two, how has your view on sales changed over your career? And why do you think that's happened? Early on in my career, I was obsessed with process. I, I tried to build a formula for everything, the perfect email, perfect discovery, perfect demo script. 
I felt like if I could just master the process, I could replicate over and over and over again and just keep what I, what I learned was people are different, situations are different, deals are different, and that rigidity was not, not effective. I had to abandon the scripts and just have conversations. I had to forget it when that was the discovery stage and exchange that for ongoing natural curiosity. As I made that shift, conversations became more enjoyable, the, the prospects became more open, and the, the success followed. And so I think that shift from make everything a process that can be duplicated to, no, let's learn what works and then shape it for the situation has, has changed dramatically over the course of my career. Sweet. It's a great answer. It's a great answer. A lot of times too, reminds me of sometimes when I am coaching or advising a startup founder and they're learning sales for the first time, they ask questions, give me the perfect subject line. What subject line works 90% of the time? Tell me exactly what you said in the Loom video or how you crafted your LinkedIn message. And I'm like, look, there's no magic bullet. You could, you could, you could literally send the exact same email uh, the exact same way at the exact same time from two totally different companies. And one could get a 10% open rate. The other could get the 90% open rate. It's simply because of what you're, what's in the email, who it's coming from uh, and, and what company you represent. So, yeah, I, I think that's right. No magic bullet in sales to the process is super important but give yourself the best chance to succeed. And that comes in some of the nuance that's in between just developing all things perfect on scripts or outbounding or LinkedIn, uh, anything like that. It, it's even liberating. Like you can get away from the why I need to memorize this and perfect it to know why I'm comfortable in this conversation. I'm just going to go talk to somebody. I used to make a point of in like a, if I had a rep in the room with me on a call and I wasn't on camera, I'd make a point like leaning back, throwing a marker around to showing, Hey, I am so comfortable right now. I'm just talking to this person. It doesn't have to be a sales call. You know, so once you realize that, I, I think it makes the job more fun. And when you have more fun, good things usually come from that. Yeah. A great point as well. And back to your mindset thread, just have fun with it. It's just people talking to people, right? It doesn't have to be so formal all the time. As long as you get the value and uh, communicate effectively, find, you know, some things that are painful, right? It's just two people having a conversation. It's not a robot selling to a robot. Uh, moving on to question number three, what is one mistake that you made early in your career that shaped the way you operate today and how has it shaped you? So it brings back a lot of bad and good memories from the learnings. I, I had a really bad victim mentality. It was such a, I, I compared myself to everybody. And when other people were having success, I would literally spend a bunch of time figuring out why they were having success, but not so I could learn from it and replicate it. It was to convince myself that they were having success because they were lucky. They had better territory. They had more inbounds, better customers. I was constantly trying to justify they're doing better, not because they are better, but because they're in a better situation, which is terrible. That completely kills productivity. Like all the time I spent worrying about how somebody else was having success was time that I wasn't creating my own success. And so when I finally determined, look, like this is one, you're not happy when you do that. Two, you're not productive. Three, if you really think you're that good, go freaking prove that you're that good. That's when I began to focus on what I had to work with, my accounts, my territory, and my career accelerated from there. But yeah, that. If you're, if you're early in your career, you're, you're busy comparing yourself, you're slowing yourself down in a significant way. Get out of that mindset as quickly as you possibly can. Yeah. I appreciate you sharing a bit about that. I have a question off of your story. So I think this happens to folks all the time, especially early and especially in a competitive environment like sales, you get the leaderboards, you know, smashed in your face all day. And it's natural, obviously to compare to others around uh, or others on the leaderboard in or outside of your specific division, was there, a, was there a moment where you were like, okay, mindset shift, I can't be, I can't be looking at it like this. I can't be trying to justify with luck or it was a specific turning point or manager or conversation where you're like, okay, this is really the turning point for me. I'm going to change the way that I think about other folks success. The, the conversation was with my second leader back then and uh, the feedback was run in your own lane. Don't stay in your own lane, but run in your own lane. And I, I realized, look, if you're really that good, prove it. Stop. I, I, I think I was using it as almost a crutch. I'm not that lucky. So that's why I'm not doing well. So I'm not going to fully commit to going all in on prospecting, skill development. 
the second I decided to run in my own lane and actually fully commit, I started putting in more time, more focus time, more personal development time, and the good things started to go from there. Yeah, that's great. Really good advice. Sounds like you had some solid leadership or solid mentors around you as well to knock you out of, you know, your own zone and into thinking big picture about where you are, your career, et cetera, which is naturally a great segue uh, to our next question. Obviously question number four is who has had the greatest impact on your career and can you expand it? Obviously you have, you have tons of folks at Qualtrics. It's a massively successful company, so I'm sure guidance there, you know, early career, later career, anyone that comes to mind. Yeah. I struggled with this question. I, I couldn't take one. I couldn't. So I'm going to break the rules a little bit and I'm going to, I'm going to give you four moments, four lessons that changed my career. So my first manager, he taught me selflessness. He was a player coach. He had his own territory, his personal quota, plus a team quota. We had a territory shift. I got not the best territory, not being a victim, but it wasn't the best territory. He, he recognized that. And so he literally gave me his territory. We swapped territories. He gave me his best accounts and looked like you can do more with this than I can. You go run with this. That was a selfless act. He could have made more money with those accounts in the short term, but he believed in me, that motivated me and that. The, the selflessness lesson was big for me early. My first region lead as I went into sales leadership taught me mindset at the lowest part of my career. When I was questioning if I even could be a sales leader, he helped me shift my mindset from these are really bad problems. Mm -hmm. These are stressful problems to know these are good problems to have because of the opportunity that they bring. That mindset shift completely changed the way I looked at a sales leader role and how I would help the, the people that I was currently struggling to help. Uh, my next region, uh, he taught me priority number one is to progress the people you work with. Priority two, can you be their friend? And that's really important for a leader because if you're a friend first, yep. you're going to have a hard time giving hard feedback. You're going to have a hard time holding them accountable and maybe your best friends for a few years, but if three years later, I'm like, holy crap, I just realized I have all these gaps in my development that you never called out for me. Why didn't you? I was your friend, man. They're going to be pissed. Like, no, I've made less money because of that. You're, you're a terrible friend. So a development first, friend second. And then the, my, my current boss has taught me the power of sincerity and empathy in leadership. No matter what kind of conversation it is, a fun conversation of praise, a difficult conversation of criticism, constructive criticism, both of those go so much better when you're sincere and you actually care about the well-being of who you manage. And his example has been tremendous in helping me learn how to apply that in the way that I meet the people I get to work with. It's great. It's great. Sounds like each chapter in your career, your progression, you've found folks, uh, or at least been around folks who have guided you of completing the, the, the leadership development or leadership circle. And that that's really cool to hear. I loved the friend versus development challenge too. I think as early managers, you know, maybe moving out of their first, their first role into that first leadership opportunity, it's really easy because a lot of times you're getting promoted to manage the group that you were just uh, contributing to, to just look around and say, oh, wow, these are all my friends. It should be easy. Now I'm just going to do the rah-rah thing and also kind of level set with them and be their buddy. But yeah, it's a, it's a more eloquent way that, that I could have put it is like, you really have to develop them before being their friend. And it's, it's important to look at it that way. Uh, I know my first step up to manager was I, I certainly had that feeling of like imposter syndrome and the default is well, just, you know, co coach them up by cheering them, cheering them right alongside them. Make sure you're not contributing next to them. You're, you're. You're guiding them. And yeah, I think having those friend conversations versus those developmental conversations is it's an easy crutch, but I'm glad you called it out. Sweet. So last question for you, if you could go back in time, it's one we obviously ask all of our guests on all seasons of the Ramp podcast. If you go back in time, now that you have the benefit of hindsight and give yourself one piece of advice as you are entering in your tier career, what advice would that be, Kyle? So my favorite question out of all of them, because I, I, I thought about it, it's like, what would be, what would have completely shifted my mindset early on if future Kyle could go back and just yell something at previous Kyle? If I could go back in time, I would say, Kyle, chill. Just chill. Yeah, I spent, there are things that cost me sleep as an AE 
that now I realize were not even an issue. I worried about him for absolutely no reason. My biggest stresses as a leader that were paralyzing me are the slightest of inconvenience. The, the things that absolutely ripped apart my world, I now know, were just a simple conversation away from being solved. I feel like I took so many things so seriously. I put so much pressure on myself to have all the answers so soon. But basically everything, well, not basically, literally everything that added so much stress to my life early on, all of it worked out just fine. So the, the way that I've gotten around this now is I use this time horizon framework when I get really overwhelmed. I just pause and I go, okay, worst case scenario, if this goes as poorly as you think it might, 12 months ago, is it going to matter? How about six months? How about three months? And literally every time I do that, the answer is no. In three months, it's not going to matter. So when I come to that realization, it's okay, Kyle, chill, sit down, figure it out and move on. But don't worry if, if younger Kyle could have learned to chill earlier on, I would have been more fun to work with, more successful, and I could have helped a lot more people along the way. But I'm, I'm grateful I learned that before I, a lack of chill drove me out of sales altogether. Yeah, it's really a solid way to think about it. And I mean, look, when I think back on the early part of my career too, I probably was just uh, the anxiety driven, right? Like that angst feeling of just, you gotta, you gotta do it. You gotta do it. You gotta do it. Uh, I think it's the first time we've heard it that clearly and that straightforward, but that's a great way to put it. And I love the framework. I love the framework. Worst case scenario, three months, six months, 12 months out, folks can apply that today. Early career folks can apply that framework today. What's the worst that's going to happen? And is that life-changing, life-altering, earth-shattering. And pretty much every time it's going to be now, especially when you're, when you're in that, uh, that first role. Que question for you, when folks are in that early stage of their career, how, even when you say, because a lot of times people hear that and they just are like, okay, you know, yes, it's easier said than done. Chill, chill, like chill out. How do you kind of knock them out of their own head to, and now that you're a manager, have that perspective? to get them to a point where they can really actualize, yeah, this is this stage of my career. Cause when, you know, early career, whether you're young or making a career switch, you're still going to feel like I really gotta, I gotta make it happen. I gotta impress. I gotta do all these different activities to move up quickly, to hit my goals. How do you like knock folks out of their own head and just get them to live in that early stage of their career? Yeah. I had a conversation not that long ago around this with a high performing account executive kind of going through one of those, one of those moments. So the approach I took was first, let's pause, look at where you already are today compared to where you thought you were going to be a year ago. Can, can we agree that you're doing pretty well? We, we agreed on that and I was okay. Now let's, let's look ahead a little bit. Let's look ahead to a year from now. What is it that you want to be accomplishing a year from now? Are we still on track to accomplish that as we get through these minor pitfalls? The answer was yes. So we're, we're realizing the progress we've made. We're building a vision where we want to be, and then we're planning together how we're going to execute to get towards that vision. So all of a sudden we have this realization of, yeah, I can do this. I'm going to do this. Here's how we're going to do this. And I, I found that that helps a lot. Amazing. Amazing. Almost, almost meditative, right? Like you're forcing yourself to be in the moment, actualize what you've accomplished, and then remind yourself that you're on that right track. It's just. It's just the journey, right? You're not just going through the motion. You're on the path that you wanted to be and carved out for yourself. So really, really cool. I can tell you're a great teacher. And I can also tell that folks will and have gotten a ton out of your coaching style and, and your teaching. Before I let you run, and I know you got very important things to go attend to, where can folks find you? Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn. You could become my either 24th or 25th Twitter follower. If you're into that, not, not much going there, but if you find me, uh, let me know. And then also uh, salesintroverts.com uh, is my, my website where I put out content, newsletter, other teachings. Well, Kyle AC, really appreciate you spending time with us, especially at this uh, life-changing moment in, in your life. Best of luck with the delivery of your third child. And we hope to see you and hear you again on the Ramp Podcast sometime in the future. I would love that, Danny. Thank you so much. Really enjoyable. Sweet. Thank you.